This is one of the great untold stories of the Iraq war. How, just over a year after the invasion, the United States funded a sectarian police commando force that set up a network of torture centers to fight the insurgency. It was a decision that helped fuel a sectarian civil war between Shia and Sunni that ripped the country apart. At its height, it was claiming 3,000 victims a month. This is also the story of James Steele, the veteran of America's dirty war in El Salvador. He was in charge of the US advisors who trained notorious Salvadoran paramilitary units to fight left-wing guerrillas. In the course of that civil war, 75,000 people died and over a million people became refugees. Steele was chosen by the Bush administration to work with General David Petraeus to organize these paramilitary police commandos. This is the only known Iraqi video footage of Steele, a shadowy figure, always in the background, observing, evaluating. The man on his left is his collaborator, Colonel James Kaufman. He reported directly to General David Petraeus, who funded this police commando force from a multi-billion dollar fund. The thousands of commandos that Steele let loose came to be mostly made up of Shia militias, like the Bada brigades, hungry to take revenge on the Sunni supporters of Saddam Hussein. Steele oversaw the commandos, mostly made up of militias. They were torturing detainees for information on the insurgency. He hears the scream of the other guy who's being tortured, you know, as we speak. There's the blood stains in, you know, the corner of the desk in front of him. The things that went on there, drilling, murder, torture, the ugliest sorts of torture I've ever seen. The U.S. was desperate for information on the insurgency, and Steele's expertise was turning that information, obtained from thousands of detainees, into actionable intelligence. Colonel Steele is one of the few people who understands how to conduct intelligence-driven operations against operational cells of an insurgency or terrorist organization. The Iraqi leader of these feared commandos was Adnan Tabit. In the city of Samarra, his commandos and their American advisors turned the main library into a detention center, where torture was a routine occurrence. Vietnam, the conflict in which over 58,000 US soldiers died, is where James Steele was first introduced to counterinsurgency as an alternative way of combating a guerrilla uprising. Steele served in the Vietnam War in the Black Horse Regiment from 1968 to 1969. He was described by General George Patton, Jr. as the best troop commander in his regiment. But if Vietnam shaped his formative military career, it was in the war against left-wing insurgents in El Salvador that James Steele secured his reputation as the counterinsurgency specialist. Steele arrived in El Salvador in 1984 as the leader of the U.S. Mill Group, a group of U.S. military advisors to the El Salvadoran Army. Todd Greentree got to know James Steele when he was working in the U.S. Embassy in El Salvador at the time. Colonel Steele, as the Mill Group commander, was in charge of all of the Special Forces teams, the, the training teams that were out at the, the, head, the brigade headquarters. The U.S. was trying to defeat a guerrilla insurgency, and American experts trained the Salvadoran security forces in the dark arts of counterinsurgency. Some of these Salvadoran paramilitary units were effectively death squads. Celerino Castillo was a U.S. drug enforcement agent who was involved in training these paramilitaries. He was widely acknowledged for his efforts. Castillo met James Steele in Salvador. 
uh, very military type, very disciplined. Uh, his decorations, uh, uh, medals and stuff that, that was uh, given to him by the U.S. military and the Salvadoran military were surrounding his office. So I was very impressed with Colonel Steele. Dr. George Vickers got to know and liked him. Samara was the first place that the connection between James Steele and the activities of the police commandos was made known to the outside world. New York Times journalist Peter Maas convinced General Petraeus to allow him and photographer Gilles Perez to visit the commandos in Samara. Their host was James Steele. What I heard is, is prisoners screaming all night long. You know, at which point you have the young US captain telling his soldiers, don't come near this thing. Gilles Perret's stark black and white photographs capture how the commandos worked in Samara. James Steele crops up in these photographs repeatedly. I was staying at the base in Samara, an American base, and I overheard soldiers, American soldiers at this base, talking about having watched prisoners be kind of strung up like animals after a hunt over a bar, um, having watched prisoners be actually tortured. Adnan Tarbit and the American military made the joint decision to set up the commando headquarters and interrogation center in the city's main library. We spoke to two men from Samara who were imprisoned in the library. Still fearful, they asked us to conceal their identities. We would be blindfolded and handcuffed behind our backs. Then they would beat us with shovels and pipes. We'd be tied to a spit, or we'd be hung from the ceiling by our hands and our shoulders would be dislocated. They electrocuted me, they hung me from the ceiling, they were pulling at my ears with pliers, stamping on my head, asking me about my wife, saying they would bring her here. The interrogation center was the only place in the kind of mini green zone in Samara that I was not allowed to visit. However, one day Jim Steele said to me, hey, they just captured a Saudi jihadi. Um, would you like to interview him? We're still completely together to bring us into the library? Maybe not. Mas and Perez were about to get an unprecedented glimpse into this clandestine world. And we kind of walk into the entrance area, and the first thing that I see is one of the Iraqi guards beating up one of the Iraqi prisoners. And then I'm taken not into the main area, kind of the main hall, um, although out of the corner of my eye, I could see there were a lot of prisoners in there with their hands tied behind their backs. I was taken to a side office where the Saudi was brought in, and there was actually blood dripping down the side of a desk in this office. We're in a room in the library interviewing Steel, and I'm looking around, I see blood everywhere. You know. And while this interview was going on, me and the Saudi with Jim Steele also in the, the room, there were these terrible screams. There was somebody shouting, Allah, Allah, Allah. But it wasn't, you know, kind of religious ecstasy or something like that. These were, these were screams of, of pain and terror. We asked General Adnan why he thought the prisoners were screaming. Maybe sometimes when officers visit the prisons, the prisoners do start shouting. They are a bit like whirling dervishes. They love to scream, Allah, Allah. And they were so loud and they were so disturbing that Steele left the room to go find out you know, what was going on because it was breaking up our, our interview. And while he was gone, the screaming stopped. And then he came back into the room and the interview continued. Although James Steele did not respond to our requests for an interview about his activities in Samara, he did tell the New York Times that he opposes human rights abuses. One American soldier in Samara was deeply affected by what he saw. At the time, I just felt like everybody knew and nobody cared that there was torture going on. Army medic Neil Smith remembers just how frightened Iraqi civilians in Samara were of the special police commandos. What was pretty widely known 
in our battalion, definitely in our platoon, was that they were pretty violent with their interrogations, that they would uh, beat people, shock them with uh, a, you know electrical shock, stab them. Um, I, I don't know what all else, you know, sounds like pretty awful things. If you sent a guy there, he was gonna get tortured and perhaps raped uh, or, or whatever, humiliated and um, just brutalized by the special commandos in order to get whatever information they wanted. I remember a 14-year-old who was tied to one of the library's columns. And he was tied up with his legs above his head. Tied up. His whole body was blue because of the impact of the cables with which he had been beaten. Petraeus defended his record with the police commandos to PBS Frontline's Martin Smith. He says he was aware of individual militia members in the commandos, but not militia groups. I did not see militia groups uh, in the special police during the time that I was there. Did you think about what you could have done differently, might have done differently? To have prevented the development of these militias that were effectively well, I, developing I, under your watch? I, again, don't, I have not seen, you know, we, we kept hearing this all the time, Martin, that this uh, or that. Uh, to find the absolute evidence of this has actually been quite difficult. But Jerry Burke, who was a senior advisor in police affairs to the Iraqi Interior Ministry, says that Petraeus must have known that organized Shia militia were dominant in the police commandos. He had to have known. Uh, these things were discussed openly, uh, whether it was at staff meetings or you know, before or after various staff meetings and general conversation. Uh, pretty much the whole world in Iraq knew that the police commandos were about a brigade. He must have known about the death squad activities. And again, it was common knowledge across Baghdad. Even Petraeus' own special advisor in the military chain of command, Colonel James Kaufman, was, according to many witnesses, working side by side with James Steele in the detention centers where torture was taking place. Colonel Kaufman declined to be interviewed by us. About General Petraeus' relationship with James Steele, the official speaking for the general said, Steele was one of thousands of advisors to Iraqi units working in the area of the Iraqi police. Journalist Peter Maas, who interviewed Petraeus at the time, remembers the relationship being a lot closer than the Petraeus statement would indicate. It was very clear that they were very close to each other in terms of their command relationship, and also in terms of their ideas and ideology about what needed to be done. Petraeus explicitly told me that he believed very, very strongly in the commandos, thought the commandos were successful, and wanted them to become bigger, stronger, and even more prevalent in the fight against the insurgency. International humanitarian law imposes obligations on those engaged in armed conflict regarding the treatment of prisoners. Not only must prisoners not be abused, but those detaining prisoners also have an obligation to ensure respect as well. It is not acceptable to turn a blind eye. It is absolutely the responsibility of every U.S. service member, if they see inhumane treatment uh, being conducted, to intervene to stop it. But I don't think you mean they have an obligation to physically stop it. It's to report it. If they are physically present when inhumane treatment is, is taking place, or they have an obligation to try to stop mm -hmm. it. The publication by WikiLeaks of thousands of diplomatic cables show that by July 2005, the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad was telling Washington about the abuse being committed by the commandos. We also learned that Adnan Tarbit was a guest at the American Embassy in Baghdad. He met the U.S. Ambassador for Counterterrorism and talked about his approach to policing. This is an extract from what he's reported to have said. Summary, fight terror with terror. Major General Tabit, who created and commands the Special Police Forces, is a Sunni officer who served time in prison for attempting to overthrow the Saddam regime. They expressed the view that it is necessary to fight terror with terror 
and that it is critical that their forces be respected and feared as this was what was required in Iraqi society to command authority. We asked Ambassador Crumpton if he had been aware that Adnan Tabit's commandos were engaged in torturing detainees. Well, I assure you, if I knew there was torture going on uh, you know, at that time with the people I was talking to, I, I would have raised it and, and discussed it. You're, you're implying that I didn't know that, and I resent that question the way you phrased it, frankly. But there are indications that the U.S. government knew what the commanders were doing. We remain troubled by the indications that at times units commanded by Tabit crossed the line. Despite these concerns, Adnan Tabit remained officially in charge until the middle of 2006. He told us that the American officials he dealt with were aware of what his men were doing. Until I left, the Americans knew about everything I did. They knew what was going on in the interrogations, and they knew the detainees. And even some of the intelligence about the detainees came to us from them. They are lying. One man who survived Samara and Nisur Square says that the police commandos lied about the fate of some of his fellow detainees. They started releasing some of the detainees. They were claiming that these detainees would return to their families. They were killing them and dumping their bodies on the streets of Baghdad. It became very obvious that this was criminal activity by the special commandos. They were eliminating their own opposition and terrorizing citizens from the Sunni community. We lost the support of a lot of Iraqi citizens who became very cynical and very anti-American. Even the ones who were friendly with us couldn't understand why we were allowing this to happen. Good afternoon, folks. Are you concerned over, and in fact, the United States looking into growing reports of uniformed death squads in Iraq, perhaps assassinating and torturing hundreds of Sunnis. And if that's true, what would that say about stability in Iraq? Comment on hypothetical questions. I've not seen reports that hundreds are being killed by roving death squads at all. I'm not going to get into speculation like that. Well, sir, that that's not a hypothetical, I don't believe. The Sunnis themselves are charging that, that hundreds have been, have been assassinated, people shot in the head, found in alleys. Um, what you're talking about are unverified, to my knowledge at least, unverified comments. I just don't have any data from the field that I could comment on in a specific way. But Donald Rumsfeld should have known about the death squad activities. James Steele had written to Rumsfeld six weeks earlier, warning him that the police commandos, armed and financed by the U.S., were effectively a Shia militia engaged in death squad activities. Memo to Don Rumsfeld from Jim Steele. Thugs like the commander of the Wolf Brigade, who has been involved in death squad activities, extortion of detainees, and a general pattern of corruption. Nearly all of the new recruits within the commandos are Shia. Many of them are Barter members.